Hello, Matt. Welcome back. I'm always thrilled to see you here in the briefing room. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything at the top, so let's get to what's on all of your minds. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, yeah, can we just start with Syria? Sure. And the decision on the suspension of aid. Mm -hmm. um, what can, can you explain exactly why this uh, step has been taken and whether it um, means anything of significance for the SMC mm -hmm. and the control that General Idris has over? Over the free Syrian army. Sure. Well, let me state first unequivocally uh, it is not a suspension of aid or a holding back of aid, but let me outline for you uh, what's happened here. We're obviously concerned uh, that Islamic Front forces have seized the Adma headquarters and warehouses belonging to the SMC, and we are, of course, uh, in close contact with General Idris and the SMC about uh, these events. We're gathering the facts, uh, consulting with friends in the Syrian opposition on the next steps uh, we can do in support of the Syrian people. Uh, and as I mentioned, of course, we're working closely with General Idris and the SMC staff at this point to inventory the status of U.S. equipment and supplies provided to the SMC. As a result of this situation, the United States has suspended all deliveries of non-lethal assistance into northern Syria while we evaluate uh, the situation on the ground and gather additional details. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, can you? But I guess the the, the question mm -hmm. is why the Islamic Front is mm -hmm. not the Al Qaeda group. Mm -hmm. In fact, they say that they claim to have no ties at all. They claim just to be, I guess, uh, Islamist, but not radical. So, is there? A, what's the? Pro and, and, and I was under the impression that you guys were willing to talk, at least talk to people who fit into that category, the category of not terrorist but not moderate who or not, not secularist. Who are not designated terrorist. At the same time, uh, Matt, uh, as you know, we've been working with the SMC. They are the group that we <coughs> have, uh, have, and we, with the international community, have designated as the coordinating group for military assistance and other assistance. We're, of course, evaluating what this means, what the impact is, but uh, as you have seen in reports and you've all reported, um, the fact that the warehouse, um, uh, the headquarters and warehouses belonging to the SMC have been taken over is certainly something concerning and has left us to, uh, to uh, given that, suspend all deliveries at this point. Uh, we're evaluating it, um, and uh, we are, of course, taking an inventory of what it means and what supplies are applicable right. well, here. Well, re recognizing that you don't have the, the – well, how, for, how are you doing the inventory? But then recognizing that you haven't done the inventory yet, do you have any idea of how much and what are, is, are, uh, is in these warehouses? Well, non-lethal assistance, as you know, uh, could include, includes items like uh, MREs, laptops, et cetera. Uh, in terms of what specifically was included in this warehouse, that is an ongoing process. I don't have a, an evaluation of that for all of you. I'm not sure we'll make a public evaluation, but certainly we're working with the SMC. We are in close <coughs> touch with General Idris, as well as uh, members of the SMC to, to uh, undergo the process of reviewing uh, what's included and are, what the impact would be. Are you aware if there was any uh, military, lethal military equipment, either supplied by the United States or by others in these warehouses? Uh, I don't have an evaluation of that uh, at this point. <clears throat> um, again, this was uh, our understanding at this point was that it was non lethal, uh, but we're, of course, evaluating uh, what was included uh, in there. All right, and then my last one is just uh, w what does this say? <clears throat> the fact that apparently the SMC forces just ran away, um, what does that say about their viability or credibility as a fighting force and as a, as a, as a credible military opponent to the, either the Assad regime or to the al-Qaeda um, linked groups? Well, Matt, I know there have been a range of reports, many of them <coughs> by many of your outlets. Uh, we're still <coughs> evaluating what happened on the ground, so I wouldn't uh, confirm or reiterate uh, reports about what happened or what exactly uh, went down on the ground. Um, this has nothing to do with our support for the SMC. It has nothing to do with our support for the opposition. It has everything to do with uh, the, the security of the material assistance, which is, of course, what we're evaluating. Um, 
But beyond that, I wouldn't want to speculate about what happened or what it means until we have more time to consult with uh, people on the ground. Have you, uh, sorry, have, you, sorry, have you any idea how long the suspension of aid might last? Uh, I don't. Uh, it's important, let me just reiterate too, and I forgot to mention this in the, uh, in the beginning part, that assistance continues through other neighboring countries to other parts of Syria. So that's what I meant by it's not suspended, it's just uh, for this particular part given the circumstances. But no idea yet whether it be a matter of week, days, weeks? Or I, I wouldn't want to put uh, a day on or a date or a date on it. Obviously it's in our interests and the international community's interest to uh, reassume uh, to uh, have the aid uh, going through this area as soon as we can but we want to evaluate the circumstances on the ground and uh, make a decision from and, there. and maybe just go back to Matt's point is a concern here that this is a, a theft or is there a concern here that this is a non-lethal aid of t of a type that you do not want going into the hands of the Islamic Front as Matt pointed out this isn't a group that you've necessarily been uh, opposed to on the ground in Syria uh, we have, as, as I know Marie talked about last week, and we have been in touch with a range of officials, as, as you all are aware. Uh, at the same time, the SMC is the group that we are working with, that we are encouraging the international community to work with on assistance, management of assistance, overseeing the assistance. So certainly it would be, it is of concern to us that uh, these warehouses and on their headquarters uh, have been have been seized by another organization. What that means and what it will mean longer term is something that we're evaluating. And can you tell us uh, again more broad broadly how much the United States has given so far in non-lethal aid to the SMC? Uh, I'd have to double check on those numbers in terms of what has hit the ground. Obviously this has been an ongoing process as you know, but I'm happy to take it and we can send around an update on what's actually uh, been processed, if that's helpful. Jim, can I ask you? We'll, we'll go to you, uh, Leslie and Michael. Leslie, and then we'll go to Michael. Go ahead. Um, how much of this, uh, um, do you know where um, Idris is at the moment? Is he back in Turkey? Because he fled, I mean, is he back in Syria? Because he fled into Turkey. I don't have any update on his whereabouts, so I'd point you to the SMC for any uh, update on that. And is it not true that the group that seized the warehouses was in talks, anyways, and it's a breakaway group, um, was in talks with Idris's group about an alliance um, that would then form part of, of the Geneva talks? I, I would point you to both of their groups and the SMC for any uh, evaluation of that. Uh, obviously, uh, we've long said, and this remains the case, that we are uh, we su would support representative delegations uh, coming to a Geneva conference. Uh, that's something we've communicated to the SMC as well as the SOC. Uh, we're working uh, closely with them as appropriate on that. Uh, as I said, we engage with a broad cross-section of Syrian people and political and military leaders. That continues uh, to be the case. But I don't think we should lose the context here that, a warehouse, that warehouses and, uh, and a headquarters that was previously run by the SMC uh, was seized, and certainly that's uh, concerning. How much of this is, has got to do with a political a leadership battle between the SMC and this uh, Islamic Front? I mean, as uh, my colleagues did point out, this is a group that um, you have been in talks with, trying to convince them to come to the to the bargaining table. How much of this is something that you think could be easily overcome through just discussions, um, or do you think that this is something much bigger? Uh, it's a good question, Leslie. I think it's too early to say uh, at this point uh, what this means uh, and, and, what, uh, and how it will be resolved and what the best steps are to resolve it. That's obviously what we're endeavoring to uh, determine with, with our contacts on the ground. Michael? Again, um, just two um, follow-ups mm -hmm. on, these, on these questions and clarifications. Um, uh, first off, um, have American officials been in touch with representatives of the Islamic Front to ask that these warehouses be returned to get their version of events of what what are the what is this group um, telling the United States and and the second question is given that the um, uh, Syrian opposition has been fragmenting a bit mm -hmm. over recent months we've all had stories about different alliances that have emerged and cropped up in different factions the Islamic Front is one of them and given that you're saying you're meeting with the broad cross-section of groups under what conditions would the United States uh, consider working with the Islamic Front or inviting them to Geneva II or cooperating with them since um, while the uh, SMC may be designated as the legitimate representative of the Syrian people, there are clearly a plethora of groups out there now. Mm -hmm. uh, 
On the second question, Michael, it is um, you are right that we do engage with a broad section of groups, uh, as I mentioned, uh, including political and medical, military leaders from, from many parties. Uh, the SMC continues to be, and this has not changed, uh, the group that we uh, work through and that we want uh, other countries to provide aid and assistance to. In terms of how a delegation will be put together and who may or may not be included, that's an ongoing conversation. Obviously, that's for the Syrian people to determine and make an evaluation of. We are in touch with them, uh, but that's not something I have an update on uh, for you today. It's a good question, not something I have an update for. The first question you asked was, what can you repeat for me one more time? Well, I have have you been in, has the, have American officials been in touch with Islamic Front officials to ask that the warehouses be returned number one and also to get and what is the Islamic Front saying about what happened how, how this came about what have they told you about it? Uh, my understanding and I'm happy to check this again with our team Michael is that our our primary focus here of course has been uh, contact with the SMC and evaluating the impact and the inventory uh, but I'm happy to check if there's any uh, additional contact uh, to, to report to all of you. Could, could you just let us know by mm -hmm. the end of the day whether you've had communications with this group sure. and what, what you might have learned from them? Happy Because it would be strange if happy you had Happy to check back and see what we can report. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Have you managed to get in touch with General Idris? Uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain we have been in touch with him and with his team and uh, about this specific issue, right. yes. And then, and, and then just uh, to clarify, th this attack was on Friday and the aid was the delivery of aid was suspended on Saturday, is that correct? Effective Saturday? I would have to double check the exact date on it. Um, obviously it was done soon after uh, we learned a little bit about it, the events on the ground. Just, Syria? Just, yes, just to clarify, do you have any general, I mean, the, the, the dialogue with Islamic Front beyond that incident? Do you have any channel with Islamic Front? I, I don't have anything more specifically to report to all of you. Uh, we've never outlined exactly who we've been in touch with. We've been clear we're not in touch with designated terrorist organizations. Uh, we are in touch with a range of officials, military leaders, political leaders. Um, I will see if there's more I can report to all of you on that front. Did SMC consult with you before giving the key of this warehouse to Islamic Front? Again, we're looking at events uh, on the ground and what's happened. Uh, we're in touch with them. Obviously, I don't think it was their preference for the facilities to be seized. I think that certainly is fair to say. Uh, beyond that, I don't have much no, more to I report mean, did, to you. Did you, con did you consult with SMC before because the, the, the inventory of U.S. was in there? Did you ask uh, your opinion about... Great. <laughs> to me? <or> <laughs> I have a little button under here. Just, oh, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. I, I mean, and did, did they ask your opinion about this decision? To, I mean, because uh, as I understand, the Al Nusra attacked the warehouse and they were trying to protect the warehouse, and finally, Islamic Front came and they gave the key of the warehouse to Islamic Front. I would say there have been a range of reports. We're still evaluating what happened on the ground. Uh, obviously, we've been in touch with the SMC about it, as we ha are every single day. In terms of communications uh, and the specifics of them, I have nothing to report to you on that front. Are you uh, the last two questions? <coughs> are you concerned about the future of SMC? Because after this incident, without any equipment and without any, I mean, the logistical support. I mean, they, they were becoming weaker and weaker day by day. Well, and we after are a, we are certainly incident. concerned, as I've said. Um, we are about. Uh, the inventory of what was included in the facilities, which we are evaluating now. Uh, while we evaluate that, I'm not going to make a determination of what it means. Uh, certainly any pause in aid uh, makes it more challenging. Uh, the, so all of those issues are issues we're looking at. In terms of what the long-term impact is, uh, it's too early to say at this point. One piece, just so I don't forget to mention, because there's been some confusion about this, um, this doesn't impact humanitarian assistance, uh, humanitarian assistance uh, is distributed, as you all know, through international non-government organizations, uh, including the UN, and, and that is not impacted. That assistance is not impacted by this. And the la la last question. Mm -hmm. uh, did you discuss this issue with Turkish government because, I mean, Turkish government also closed the border mm -hmm. that the Jilvegas were just across the Atmeh, the, the village that the, the Islamic Front took control of. Uh, and did you discuss this issue with Turkish government? It was a synchronized decision again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should move on to a new person and see if it goes on. Uh, we, uh, we certainly are in close contact, as you know, uh, with the Turkish government in terms of whether this specifically has been discussed with them. I'd have to, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to follow up on that and see if there's anything to read out for you. 
Uh, let's go to Margaret, and then we can go to you. Go ahead. In the U.S. concern more broadly, though, that these heavily armed Islamist groups are coming to dominate among the rebels. Well, uh, Margaret, we're talking about an incident which we're obviously concerned about, as I've mentioned, uh, that includes uh, specific headquarters and warehouses in the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. uh, we're concerned about the inventory that may have been impacted. We've had to suspend uh, non-lethal assistance to that area. So clearly we've taken steps and we are concerned about it. We're not prepared at this point uh, to make a broad statement about what it means and what the long-term impact will be. We're evaluating that. We're in close contact with the SMC and we will see over the course of time what this means. But there have been some very high-profile defections from the SMC over to the Islamic Front, which seem to suggest that they're stronger and that they are dominating here. Uh, you know, that is, uh, uh, the SMC continues to be the group and the organization that we have worked with, that international communities are working with. Uh, obviously, uh, events are challenging on the ground, uh, but our support for them is long-standing, and we're not prepared at this point to make an evaluation of what the impact of these events are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does this uh, decision reflect any changes in the U.S. policy towards the regime, the Syrian regime first and the opposition second? Uh, no. Uh, in fact, um, to be absolutely clear, this is about uh, specific uh, military uh, specific uh, uh, material assistance, I should say. Uh, this is not related to our support for the opposition. We still remain firmly supportive of the opposition uh, and of the SMC. Uh, that's why we're in close contact with them. We're gathering the facts. We're consulting with them. We are doing a uh, full uh, evaluation of the inventory, uh, but we remain uh, firmly supportive of the opposition. So, Margaret's question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you're concerned about the warehouse in itself, but it is symbolic of a larger problem, which is that Islamic groups are, are taking greater control of, over swaths of the country, including a crossing with a NATO ally. So, I mean, that's got to be a larger concern in terms of your, um, when you look at the strength of this opposition and whether you may need to um, rethink, you know, um, your unequivocal support just for this group. Well, I, I'm not. It is a good question. Uh, we are evaluating that. Uh, we are not ready to make any long-term evaluation or decision about that. We remain firmly committed to uh, the SMC and to providing them assistance. Certainly, an event like this is concerning, as I've said. Um, and it is. There have been other incidents, as, as you've mentioned, which we express concern about as well. Uh, but right now, uh, we are continue to work with the SMC. We continue to work with. Uh, the SOC, both on, a, on military mm -hmm. assistance, but also on uh, on uh, preparing for a Geneva conference, and, and that has not changed. Uh, related? Yes. Do you care if Geneva too is not actually in Geneva? <laughs> uh, I you, knew you were going to ask. Is Montreux question. okay? Well, Matt. Montreux is fine with me. How about Lausanne? <laughs> There are, Davos. There are a lot of Resort. beautiful, beautiful Does it have options to be in Switzerland. Does it have to be Switzerland? Uh, well, I think the benefit of the reason why there was uh, <clears throat> planning to have this in Geneva was because of all the resources there that you're all well aware of. Obviously, we've seen uh, the comments uh, made by uh, Brahimi. Uh, we understand the logistical challenges, uh, and that is something that is being worked through. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you find it to be unfortunate at all that a gathering of watchmakers is going to force this conference, this very important political conference with, you know, geopolitical uh, strategic ramifications out of your desired city? Well, Matt, as long as we have representative delegations and we have the rooms and the uh, the resources we need, uh, I'm sure we can uh, move the process forward. So Mont forward. Montreux is okay? Uh, I, I don't think a final decision has been made. Well, I know they're working okay? through logistical dates. I don't think that uh, the location is our primary concern so, here. But do you have your representative delegations yet? Uh, you would certainly know if there were representative delegations. As you as you know, the next uh, trilateral meeting is on December 20th, so certainly there they'd be discussing uh, the agenda attendance uh, as well as uh, where things stand with the delegations from both sides. So no news at the moment, though? I don't have any news at that on the, that issue at this point. Given the situation that we've seen over the weekend and the growing um, influence of extremists on the ground, and um, you also had a couple, uh, a couple other developments. You had the... Um, kidnapping of a major opposition figure, Rezun Zatuna, which is one of the leaders, really, of the moderate opposition. Mm -hmm. um, do you really think Geneva, the Geneva Conference, is it's a good time to hold it right now when certainly the strength of the opposition is being questioned, and would they really have the kind of influence that they would need at the bargaining table? 
Uh, well, uh, Elise, we certainly, I mean, on the, uh, we believe the Geneva Conference is, it, it's important to happen right now for many of the reasons you mentioned, which is that there's no military solution on the ground. Uh, we believe that. The Russians believe that. We're continuing to work both with both sides to bring them to the table. Uh, we're talking about the future of Syria, uh, the future of the uh, tens of thousands of, of people or more who are living in Syria and at risk every single day. Uh, that's an argument we're making uh, to both sides, and we feel it's vitally important to do this now. So that hasn't changed. Any information about President Zaytouni's uh, whereabouts? Uh, I don't. We have, of course, seen the reports. We're obviously very concerned by them. Uh, we're looking to get more information and facts uh, regarding the situation. Um, and uh, I don't have any other particular update at this and moment. She was um, taken in an area that was is controlled um, by extremist groups. She has been, you know, the and more that she's been criticizing. Um, the kidnappings and, and work of al-Qaeda-related groups, she's been threatened, so... Right, and there have been claims made by certain groups, but in terms of her whereabouts, I don't have any information on that. Jim, do you have any specific expectations from Islamic Front to start a dialogue with them? For example, if they assure you that they will uh, deny to, to contact with al-Nusra or ISIS, I mean the al-Qaeda-related groups, would it be enough for you to start a dialogue with them? Uh, I, that's a hypothetical at this point, and I don't have anything to to add to that. Yeah, yeah. Syria or yeah, okay. Yeah. To Michael's question is with the contacts. Part of these groups, many of them, they have contact with Saudi Arabia or Qatar. Do you, are you in contact with them to mediate or make channels of communication? I, I address this a little bit in that we've said we've long said that we're in touch with a range of groups, whether they're political or military leaders or officials. We've never outlined the specifics of those, and I have no plans to do that today. No, I'm just asking you, talking to the Saudis and the Qataris about... Oh, sorry, I understood your question to mean about wrong. the specific groups they're in touch with. Are we in touch with the Saudis and the Qataris Qatar, about... Because it, as much as we know, and most of it was reported that many factions of these groups are in contact and even funded by those two countries. Well, certainly, uh, I'm not going to verify or confirm any of the range of reports that have been out there, some of which are conflicting. Uh, certainly, we have continued to encourage all of our international partners to provide assistance and aid through the SMC and not through other groups. Uh, of course, uh, discussion of, uh, you know, extremist elements or other groups is part of what we talk about uh, whenever the Secretary and other officials from the administration uh, speak with the Saudis or the Qataris or other uh, important countries in the region, and that's uh, part of our ongoing dialogue with them. Do you think that uh, this w is going to impact the way the U.S. is going to try to bring together an opposition, um, several representatives of the opposition in Geneva? Uh, it is too early to say, Leslie. I know I keep saying that, but given these events are just a couple of days old and we're still evaluating what they mean, um, we still remain uh, focused on and uh, committed to uh, working with the opposition on a delegation that's representative of the different factions of the Syrian opposition. That certainly would include the SMC. Uh, that obviously hasn't been determined yet and is something we we'll continue to work with them on. You know, I, we know that you conveyed several, I mean, the messages to the, especially the Turkish government regarding the foreign fighters going to Syria through mm -hmm. Turkey and joining the, the radical elements in, in northern Syria. Islamic Front was part of this problem, or just you were mentioning on Al Nusra or ISIS when you will convey convey these messages to Turks. We've talked about concern about any foreign fighters from any country, so uh, that hasn't changed. That's consistently well, I'm, been our I'm position. I'm trying to to understand your view on Islamic Front. Was, I don't was think I have anything more to add for it to you than what I've already said. Do we have any more on Syria? Syria, Joe. Uh, sure. Ch do you have more Syria or? India. Uh, well, let's go to Ukraine, and then we can go to India. India. To India, okay. Um, I wanted to ask about um, what we saw overnight. The Secretary put out a very strong statement mm -hmm. registering his disgust at um, the um, what was happening in the, in the square. Um, and S Assistant Secretary Newland has been back in Kiev for her second visit mm -hmm. after, after talks in Moscow. Is she... What is what is the... What role is uh, Assistant Secretary um, Newland playing in trying to defuse this crisis? Uh, well, she met uh, with President Yanukovych this morning. Uh, that may have been in some of the readout, mm -hmm. but just for those of you who uh, ha had not seen that. 
uh, and with opposition and civil society leaders yesterday. As you mentioned, this was her second visit in the last uh, week, uh, and she is uh, currently now on her way back to the United States. Uh, the role she has played, um, you know, as you know, the vice president spoke with uh, President Yanukovych uh, just yesterday, two days ago, I believe, uh, and she made it clear uh, that what happened last night is uh, absolutely uh, impermissible in a European democratic state. Uh, she also made clear that we believe there is still a way forward uh, for Ukraine, uh, that it is still possible to save Ukraine's uh, European future. And we want to see uh, President Yanukovych uh, lead his country back onto that path, and that this is a pivotal moment to either uh, meet the aspirations or disappoint uh, the voices of the people. Uh, so that is a message that she uh, communicated in her <coughs> meeting with President Yanukovych uh, this morning when she And then in her talks in Moscow, she was talking about the situation in Moscow as well, was she? Uh, she was in Moscow as well. I think it, that was two days ago. Um, let me just see how and did I Ukraine that. come up in the conversations? Uh, I believe, yes, it certainly did. Um, let me just find my rundown of that. Give me one moment. <clears throat> see. <clears throat> I'm just looking for my exact rundown of the meeting she had while she was there. Um <clears throat> So I don't have that in front of me, but I'm happy to get that to all of you. Um, you know, while she was there, you, you've heard us say many times, and you've heard Assistant Secretary Newland say many times that uh, our view is this is not a zero-sum game, uh, that there are, can be relationships and friendships and partnerships with a range of countries. Uh, the people of Ukraine uh, have spoken and have made clear of their support for and interest in uh, European integration. Uh, and uh, she certainly discussed a range of topics while she was in Russia, but that was certainly one of them. And then this morning or last night, she was down, she went down and visited the protesters mm -hmm. and there's pictures of her handing out, I think it's cakes and cookies. Or, what was the purpose of that visit? Why, why go down to the square and to support? Well, she had been, I believe, to, to, as well as visiting, what she had visited with opposition leaders and, and officials last week on her first visit as well. And it, it's important to uh, convey um, our support for uh, their uh, ability to voice their uh, views, uh, support for their efforts um, on European integration, uh, our belief that respect for democratic principles, including freedom as, of assembly, is a universal right, not just an American uh, right. So she, uh, it's obviously been a challenging couple of days, and she went down there to, uh, to show her support. Are you, you, you said earlier that this kind of, what, the, what happened last night is impermissible in a European democratic state. Does, does the administration regard Ukraine as a European democratic state? Well, we're talking about the aspirations of the people. So it's still an aspirational thing. Of course. All right. And you, you would know if it said, was not. <laughs> you also said that um, uh, there is still a chance or still something, I can't read my writing, to save Ukraine's European future. Uh, that's right. Still what I mean is. It's still possible to save U uh, Ukraine's European future. Are you convinced from the discussion that the Vice President had with President Yanukovych and, um, uh, and Assistant Secretary Newland's conversation? With him, that um, that that the Ukrainian leadership is interested in having a European future. Well, that's up to the European. I mean, the Ukrainian leadership to speak to. Uh, what we're talking about is well, uh, if they're not interested, if you're selling something that they're not interested in buying. Well, Matt, as, as you, you know, have, they yeah. have they have taken several steps towards it in the last several months. So, and uh, several giant steps away from it as well. So, I I I'm not sure. I'm just wondering if you believe that when you tell the Ukrainian authorities that there is still a chance to save your European future, if they. Can't. Well, the context I mean, of that, they, they, they I'm not going to speak for whether what their views are, but Matt, the context is you have people protesting in the streets making clear that they, what their preference is, the people of Ukraine. Well, well and I understand as that. as they're people... listening to that and trying to determine what to do about it, uh, the EU has made clear they're still open to entertaining a process forward with Ukraine, and that is what we're conveying. Right, but I mean, 
you know, look, there were protests in Eastern Europe in the 50s and 60s against, you know, Soviet, or, you know, Russia, what was then the Soviet Union domination, and the leadership in both Moscow and in those countries, uh, you know, they were, they, they, well, they were, they, they were, they crushed that thing, kind of thing. So are you convinced that they, that, that Yanukovych and the, uh, and his, you know, his government care about or have any interest in a, Euro, in, a few, in, a, in a European future, or in being a European democratic state? Well, because I, I, I mean, their, their action, you always say actions speak louder than words, certainly. and it would seem to me that last night's actions and the actions over the weekend, or since this has all happened, which it, which it would, would lead you in the exact opposite direction, which makes, I think, the argument kind of a, a feeble one if they're not interested in it. Well, Matt, I think the point is that there is still an opening uh, obviously, President Yanukovych spoke to the with the vice president. He met with Assistant Secretary Newland, I believe, for uh, an hour or two, um, and uh, certainly they had a robust discussion about uh, what the options are moving forward. Uh, it was important, from our view, to make the case that uh, despite the events of the last few weeks, there is still an opening on an opportunity to move towards a European. So, so you so you think that the president's willingness to meet or to speak with you guys. I wasn't is doing an indication Matt, that I wasn't doing an analysis of what it meant. And, I'm just indicating that obviously we've been right. discussing and, the issue. And when the say, let's talk about the. Uh, I recognize that the White House may be a better place to answer this, but you you said that they laid out options for or you know potential avenues for proceeding. Well, further. I don't want to overstate well, I what, what that, I meant by that. What I was what I meant by that is that there is still a path forward right. to European so integration. So presumably. Tell me if I'm wrong. The vice president didn't say in his conversation with the president that, you know, one of the options you have available is a brutal crackdown on demonstrators and sub freezing, uh, sub -freezing I weather. Think is that's that correct? Fairly safe to so, assume that. So he, in other words, he acted ex you know, 180 degrees differently from what the vice president uh, said would, would, would be I don't a, have more details on the vice the president's opening. conversation than what they have read out and provided to all of you. Obviously, given we're at a pivotal point here, uh, given that sending our belief is sending riot police in is beyond the pale, that was the reason for the strong but why, statement. Why is it important for, or why is it in Ukraine's interest to move towards Europe? Uh, well, we've spoken about this a bit. I think, uh, one, that is not, it's not as important or important what the United States' view is. It's the Ukrainian people uh, have spoken out and been clear that is their preference. Uh, and that is something that they would like to see the country move toward. And obviously, they were very close just a couple of weeks ago, and there were steps taken back since then. Uh, so given the events on the ground, given how loud the voices are of the people in Ukraine, uh, that is what we're referring to. But what if it's a wrong decision? I mean, they elect a government to choose decisions for them. If they don't like the decision that the government's taking, then presumably they should take it to a ballot box. Uh, well, I think they're also voicing their... Uh, dissatisfaction with the steps of the government, and obviously the government's response to that uh, with riot police last night is, is something we found completely unacceptable. Jim, um, what is the U.S. proposed, um, you know, to, to lure um, Ukraine, you know, to democratize? I mean, have you, has, did um, Assistant Secretary Newland actually go with some proposals, economic and political proposals? Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into all the specifics of, of any conversation, um, but obviously getting back into a conversation with Europe and with the IMF uh, and bringing, of course, justice and dignity to the people of Ukraine is what we were, uh, what our strong message was uh, on the ground. All policy options, uh, including sanctions, are on the table uh, in our view, uh, but obviously that still is being uh, evaluated. If, if, there, if, this, if the Ukrainian leadership doesn't, um, accede to these requests from the street. Um, what further measures could the United States uh, impose? Would you be prepared to go, for instance, down the road of um, imposing sanctions on individual she's, Ukrainians? She's said that. Did you say that? Oh, yes. <laughs> Excuse me. I was put no. Like what kind of sanctions? I'm not going to get into specifics of that. Uh, we're considering policy options. There obviously hasn't been a decision made. Uh, sanctions are included, but. Uh, I'm not going to outline Can more you, specifics. You refresh, my, please refresh my memory. The last election that Ukraine had, you regarded as acceptable. 
I, I would have to, fair? I believe, probably, yes. Okay, so kind of like the Egyptian election might have had a little. I knew there some, was a comparison uh, coming here. Problems, I was trying but, to sniff it out. Well, I just want to know <laughs> if you, you know, you know, mass protests in the street, um, if that, if if, if that's, uh, if you're, if you believe that this relates to Joe's question, I mean, people elect a government, or a president, and and, and, a, and a parliament. Um, and if they, if they don't like it, they can demonstrate, surely, sure, and you think that they have the right to demonstrate, but, I mean, can they control the, the do, you, do you believe that the, the mass of, a mass of people should be determining the Ukraine's foreign policy, or should that be left to the government to decide? Well, Matt, obviously listening to the voices of the people in Ukraine is something we feel is important. Uh, this was a case where uh, Ukraine was deciding between two paths. You know what our view was on the better path. Um, and given they came so close, they took other steps. Uh, that is just the message we are communicating to the government. But do you think political or economic sanctions? Uh, I'm not going to get into any more specifics. Uh, again, there's a range of options that we are open to, but we're not at that point at this stage. And what about well, the IMF? Would you be prepared to um, support... Um, the IMF, um, an IMF loan for Ukraine, for instance, would that well, be an option? Well, we do believe they should be in contact uh, with not just the getting, they should get back into a conversation with uh, the IMF in terms of uh, what steps would be taken. Uh, we're not quite at that point yet. Are you, do you know if the uh, issue of potential sanctions came up in the conversation that Vice President Biden had or in uh, Tory's conversations? Uh, I'm are, happy are the Ukrainians aware, other than of this briefing, that this is a possibility. I'm sure they're all watching live right now. They might be. <laughs> uh, I would have to check on that, Matt, for you. I'm happy to do that. How, how do you view the role that Russia is playing in Ukraine? Well, we, we've talked about this a bit in here. Uh, we've communicated to Russia that we, of course, don't feel this is a zero-sum uh, game. We understand that they have put options on the table. Uh, the EU has uh, put their own options on the table. Uh, but, um, you know, we continue to believe that the preference of the people of Ukraine should be what the government listens to. Yeah. Yes, and then we can go to India. You've been very patient. Go ahead. Um, I just want um, so usually when sanctions are imposed, it's, it's because um, a country has misbehaved in some way. I mean, and you say that you haven't reached that point yet. What, well, what about exactly? making decisions about it, but we're certainly... Is, is this because of the, the crackdown on the protesters, or it's not to punish them for not get, move, looking, you know, towards a greater um, uh, integration? Would it be because of the, the political crackdown? Well, certainly there are a range of events on the ground that we're looking at, and uh, clearly we have concerns about uh, the events of the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm just talking about options, not any decision that's been yeah. made. Interesting. Interesting. Just in the end of Russia and that this is not a zero-sum game, but you're, on the other hand, presenting a choice between um, a trade deal or sanctions. That sounds kind of zero-sumish, doesn't it? Uh, I think you're combining a few things there, Chris. Okay. I, I think, you know, the, obviously there have been a, a range of events on the ground over the last couple of weeks that we've expressed our uh, incredible concern about. Um, what we mean by uh, not a zero-sum game with Russia is that uh, Russia can also, of course, have a relationship. We're talking about what's best for the future of the people in Ukraine in terms of their integration. So that's a separate question. Okay. Uh, and in terms of sanctions, uh, obviously that's not a decision that's been made. But of course, in, as in many cases, we can consider a range of policy options, which we're certainly doing uh, in this case, given events on the ground. Uh, do we have any more in Ukraine? Uh, one more, but do you think that the Russians are playing a constructive role in, in Ukraine? I don't have any evaluation of that. Uh, this isn't about the U.S. versus Russia. This is about Ukraine and uh, the, the, the voices of the people in Ukraine and what they've expressed to the government and their, uh, the importance of their ability to, uh, to, uh, to express their views and, and abide by democratic principles, and, and that's where our concerns lie. Back to Syria? Oh, well, we, I promised India, so let's go to India, and then we can go back to Syria. Uh, you must have seen the... Indian Supreme Court decision criminalizing homosexuality, which has sent, you know, shockwaves in the global LGBT community. And it's more important because only yesterday Secretary Kerry issued a statement on Human Rights Day mm -hmm. and in which he mentioned LGBT. So what is the reaction that, uh, and 
especially because the Indian Foreign Secretary is in town. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we of course are aware of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, the United States places great importance on the uh, protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms of all people. And as you saw and as you referenced in the Secretary's statement yesterday, that includes lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons around the world. Uh, we oppose any action that criminalizes consensual same-sex conduct between adults, uh, LGBT rights or human rights. Uh, that's something you've heard uh, Secretary Kerry say, I believe Secretary Clinton uh, say before him. And we call on all governments uh, to advance equality for LGBT individuals around the world. I know you asked me about um, the visit of the Foreign Secretary. I'm happy to give a, a readout of that if that's helpful as well. Uh, Secretary Kerry and Deputy Secretary Burns uh, met yesterday with Indian Foreign Secretary Singh to discuss ways to deepen the U.S.-India strategic partnership and consult on regional issues. Foreign Secretary Singh also met with Acting Undersecretary Rose Gottmiller, Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asia Nisha Biswal, and other senior officials. The United States and India agreed to joint principles to strengthen India-U.S. cooperation on training UN peacekeepers, uh, developed with support from the Department's Global Peace Operations Initiative. Uh, the United States also accepted India's invitation to serve as a partner country for India's Technology Summit and Expo in New Delhi in, fall, in the fall of 2014, uh, further intensifying our broad uh, scientific cooperation. Uh, thank you. Are you, are you planning to reach out to the Indian government to express your uh, directly about uh, what needs to be done? Because if you see the, um, the atmosphere there, the political parties, the pressure, and, mm -hmm. you know, it is not just uh, a, a vague Supreme Court decision. Well, we, uh, have con we consistently bring up human rights issues with uh, most countries we meet with, and I don't have any specific recent uh, call or meeting to read out for all of you, but, but certainly that's something we're happy to express publicly and privately as needed. Well, meeting between the top diplomat for the administration and his deputy and the Indian Foreign Secretary. This that didn't come up? That happened yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, I, I don't ha I'm not aware of when. I believe this decision may have been today, the Supreme Court decision. Yeah, but she yeah. still has a meeting today, too, in the building. Uh, hmm? She had a meeting today also. Was this issue brought up with her? Today? Uh, with who, who was the with meeting the with today? I don't know, but I think but she had some town. meetings here today also. I'd have to check on that. I, I, I was under the impression that most of the meetings were yesterday, but I'm happy to check. And if there are meetings today, we can check if this issue came up. Yeah, but the question... Uh, in, 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 the initial, in your initial response, I didn't hear you actually give any reaction to what the decision actually was. Uh, I'm presuming that you think it's a bad ruling by the Supreme Court. But I didn't hear you say that. Well, we, Can you go I, ahead? I believe Can you say I w that? by saying we oppose any action that criminalizes consensual same sex conduct between adults uh, in general around the world, I think I was uh, pretty clear about what our view is. So, what do you think about the, specifically about the Indian Supreme Court decision? Uh, I I'm think looking for something that's got the word India in the answer. Uh, Matt, I, I'm not sure I other have much more to so add other than to convey that any legislation uh, around the world, whether it's India or any other country that but this uh, isn't criminalizes, legislation. I'm sorry, any action uh, that criminalizes uh, 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 consensual same-sex conduct between adults uh, that uh, doesn't recognize that uh, that uh, fundamental freedoms of people include uh, their right to uh, sexual orientation. Um, those are issues that we certainly would be concerned about as we are here. So you are expressing concern about the Supreme Court decision in India on this case? Correct. Okay. Just to clarify it one more time. Sure. So you are opposed to the Supreme Court decision and you are going to raise this issue with the Indian government, right? I think I expressed our concern about any cases along these lines. Uh, we are in regular touch about these issues and others with India. I don't have anything specific to read out for you in terms of future meetings or conversations about this. And um, regarding Foreign Secretary Singh's meetings mm -hmm. here, was the issue of Bangladesh uh, discussed? Because there have been some differences between the two countries on this issue. Uh, I don't have that in my particular readout. I'm happy to check if that was an issue uh, during their meetings. And, and was the issue of the Sri Lanka raised? In these meetings? I don't have more than what uh, I read okay. out for you. Uh, we can check if Sri Lanka and Bangladesh came up as a part of the conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Secretary had a conversation this morning with uh, Prime Minister Hasina. Mm -hmm. It was actually late last night. Oh, was it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> what prompted that call, and could you give us a, a readout of sure. what was said between the two of them? 
Uh, well, uh, he did speak with uh, Hasina uh, about current events uh, in Bangladesh. Um, we have uh, part of the discussion was uh, conveying the importance of major parties coming together on a way forward for elections that are free, free fair, and credible in the eyes of the uh, Bangladeshi people. Uh, we also uh, he also we also welcomed the visit of UN Assistant Secretary General Oscar Fernandez Taranko to Dhaka, where he is meeting with both parties to encourage a peaceful way forward. Uh, so they discussed a range of topics, and certainly that was a big focus of the message the secretary conveyed. India, India? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, um, does the United States expect India to the parliament? Let me just back to the parliament. Does it expect the India Indian parliament to repeal that legisl that law? I don't have any other uh, comment for you on the Supreme Court case than than what I've just offered, or any other expectation of step. That's obviously steps the Indian government would take. So, is there any uh, is there any options at all? The Supreme Court uh, is there any options at all? The State Department is examining to encourage India to repeal that law. That's a decision that the Indian government would make. Uh, we obviously don't make decisions on behalf of government, other governments, and their legislation. Uh, so, I expressed our uh, deep concern about uh, any efforts around the world to. Uh, to uh, to uh, not recognize that uh, LGBT rights are human rights, and uh, that's a message we'll continue to convey. Well, the only problem with that is, is that <coughs> you're threatening sanctions on Ukraine, or saying that they're 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 a possibility because they're violating people's human rights and not listening to the, not not listening to the people, and yet uh, here with India, the, you know, it's not even clear whether this is has come up, will come up, or will ever come up with the Indian government. And in fact, the meeting, the readout that you gave of the meetings yesterday, so everything with India is full speed ahead, well, and we're intensifying case, our relationship. This case, and, as I understand it, the Supreme right. Court case was this today. Right. Okay. Those meetings That's were yesterday. Up. I think I expressed pretty clearly our opposition to this. Uh, in terms of what steps would be taken by a government uh, on a Supreme Court case, that's not something I would have a comment on. Uh, obviously, the events in Ukraine, uh, we've expressed our deep concern about and the reasons why. And as you know, we don't group every country and everything that happens uh, into the same category. Every circumstance is different. Another human rights question, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, a Turkish journalist and at the same time a member of parliament was released after almost four and a half years. Region. Do you have a statement on that? After, I mean, the following the Turkish constitutional mm -hmm. court. Do you have any? Uh, statement uh, on that? You're, I think you're talking about Mustafa Balba. Balba. Yes. Uh, we are. We welcome his release and are pleased to see him uh, take up his official uh, duties in Parliament. Uh, so, and also there are six member of parliaments uh, similar with his case. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any reaction? Do you have any comment on that? Uh, as you know, we evaluate uh, the, uh, the issue of due process and our concerns as it relates to Turkey and our human rights report uh, every year when we issue that. I don't have anything specific on other individual cases. I'll, I can see if there's more uh, on those to report on. Because the Turkish Constitutional Court's decision was based on uh, the status of mem being a member of parliament. And there are also six members of parliaments who have been jailed. And, uh, there are some debate on that in Turkey too. That uh, arguing this decision should apply for others too. Well, so. I, I don't want to speak go too far on the circumstances around the six members of parliament. I'm not familiar with all the details. But uh, as you know, we uh, certainly express regularly our concerns about uh, due process in Turkey, including in our annual report. We express, uh, as needed, uh, concerns about uh, freedom of media, freedom of expression. Uh, as well, um, and uh, those are those are certainly uh, issues that we're we're happy to continue to voice our, our concerns about. Human rights. Hmm, human rights. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yesterday on the on the hill there was a hearing about the violations of human rights in Egypt, and the vice chair of the U.S. Commission of Religious Freedom raised the issue that uh, he or the commission submitted a letter to the. White House and the State Department regarding what happened to the churches and the religious minority, specifically Coptic minority in mm -hmm. Egypt. And he said that no response came, although it was raised in September. Do and you have it was a letter to the White House or to the State Department? Both. I mean, he said both, I mean, as much as I remember. And the, who, I'm sorry, who was the author of the letter? Who was the letter U.S. From? Commission for Religious okay. Freedom. 
And uh, I'm just ans trying to figure out, do you have anything to say about that? I'm, I'm happy about to check on the status of the letter and our response. As you know, we regularly respond to letters. Uh, we have uh, been very clear about our concerns about the actions taken against uh, Coptic Christians and other minority groups in Egypt, and I don't think there's any secret about that. So let me uh, take a look, uh, talk to our team, and see if there's more we can say on the So letter. there is another thing related to the trial of uh, the, the the general guidance of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Muhammad Badia, and it was raised the issue in the last few days. Do you have anything to say about that? Do you, are you following it? Are you interested about it or uh, concerned certain, about certainly it? Certainly we follow it very closely, and you're right. I know there have been a, a range of uh, reports about uh, Badia as well as, um, as, well as uh, others, uh, in ter including sentence reductions, et cetera. Uh, while we welcome the sentence reductions and release of some pro-Muslim Brotherhood female demonstrators, concerns remain about the overall climate leading to arrests and detentions in Egypt. Uh, we continue to look to the government of Egypt to ensure the Egyptians are afforded due process with fair and transparent trials uh, and uh, continue to convey our belief that civilians should be sent to civilian court. Uh, we have consistently called for an end to politicize arrests and detentions uh, and we will continue to do so. This Is this done through the your your presence on the ground, I mean the embassy or? Sure, or absolutely communicated on the ground as well as, as publicly. Uh, more on uh, Egypt, any more on Egypt? Okay. Uh, Turkey. Turkey. Uh, by the way, uh, I am Arkan from Anatolia and Insurgency. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet uh, you too. Could you comment on Turkey's Foreign Minister uh, Ahmet Davutoglu's visit to Armenia? He's going to travel to Ye uh, Yerevan tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, and he's going to attend to uh, Belexia Cooperation uh, Organization's meetings. Uh, I mean, it's going to be, you know, the first meeting after such a long time from Turkey. What would, what could you say about his visit? Uh, well, we welcome his uh, planned trip and hope his visit will provide an opportunity for dialogue between regional leaders. Uh, we continue to urge both Turkey and Armenia to ratify the normalization protocols and to pursue tan uh, tangible steps, such as opening the border, uh, that can help strengthen ties between neighbors and create jobs and opportunity for the people of both countries. So we certainly support uh, the, the visit and we're hopeful they'll be able to uh, move pr the process forward. Somalia? Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, on Monday there was um, a woman, a 19-year-old, who alleged that she was raped, who was um, sentenced by a Somali court to a suspended six-month jail sentence for defamation and lying. And the two journalists who had reported her story have also been handed similar sentences. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you had a comment on that. Um, I have seen those uh, reports, Joe. I don't have anything specific on it, so let us venture to get you something after the briefing. Okay. I have one on the journalists as well. Okay. Um, China's authorities have been denying uh, visas for American journalists in China, um, presumably for their investigative reports. I know that Biden raised this issue last week when he was in China with Xi Jinping, but mm -hmm. I want to know if the State Department had any particular reaction to these reports. Uh, well, you're right that Vice President Biden raised this uh, when he was in Beijing just last week. I, I know he also met with a group of journalists um, while he was there to discuss this issue. Uh, we certainly um, have uh, been uh, very engaged with uh, concerns about uh, the uh, the efforts to, uh, to deny visas, efforts to uh, deny the ability of, of media publications to uh, report, to express their public views, to uh, engage in, uh, in, in their craft, for lack of a better word, and that's something we've communicated to uh, the Chinese government, and, and as you know, the Vice President did while he was there just last week. So laughing is not a word, What we do is not craft. It is, it's crafty some days. Yeah. <laughs> same question yes. Um, today, um, John Kerry met with Samantha Powers. Uh, was it about the CAR or were there other issues? Uh, it was a, it was, it's been a long scheduled uh, breakfast, um, uh, as I understand it. I don't, I, I don't know the exact topics. I'm happy to check with him, him and see uh, what else came up. Can I ask about, uh, just briefly uh, about the trip? Mm-hmm. Um, Last week, when he was in um, Jerusalem and and, uh, and wherever he saw President Abbas, was it Ramallah? I'm not remember. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you, there, were, there was a lot of talk about the security plan, or mm -hmm. rather, ideas for a security plan. Uh, thoughts, right? And I'm just, I'm, I'm just ideas, wondering, is this, yes, this, this, this trip 
uh, I mean, do you expect that that to be a focus of or, or the focus of this current one? Is it still, are you still thinking that if you can get a West Bank security proposal accepted that that will unblock or that may help unblock other parts of the, uh, of the negotiation? Or is the Secretary really going to be um, not focused on this in particular but on other things? Well, the reason why the last trip was focused on security is because, uh, as you know, General Allen and his team had been going through a, a, long, a lengthy, in-depth review of the security challenges uh, in Israel, as well as, um, as well as um, in a viable, in, as we look to a creation of a viable independent Palestinian state. Uh, it was at the time we had enough to report on in terms of ideas and uh, and uh, and prospects from our evaluation. So that was the purpose, to make that presentation mm -hmm. and, and have a discussion. Uh, we certainly expect that security will be part of the discussion, given it's such an important issue. Uh, but it is different than last week in that okay. there isn't a presentation being made. Right. But, I mean, this is, this is kind of like a follow-up, or part of it is a follow-up to that, trying to get mm -hmm. both sides on board. Or are you still in the, uh, in the uh, receiving... Uh, are you still willing to, you know, get receive suggestions from the two sides about how, how it can be? Covered? It is. We've always seen it. Uh, the security issue, border issues, all of the big issues. Uh, this is not a here's a plan. Uh, please yeah, ask for upper down. Oh, it's important uh, on this issue. This is an ongoing discussion. Uh, certainly, we expect they will talk about security as they will discuss other issues. Uh, as the secretary was leading, uh, leaving uh, last week, uh, he had a limited amount of time. Uh, because he had to get back for events on Saturday. Uh, he made the determination in consultation with both parties that on his way to Asia, he would come back to continue the conversation. But uh, this isn't about uh, unsticking uh, a process. Uh, the, the meetings are ongoing. Uh, the parties have been meeting with each other, including earlier this week in Washington. Uh, so this is to discuss all of the issues on the table uh, that that are uh, important as we right. as we work toward so a final status. Continuing agreement. the conversation on the security. So is General Allen going to be there as well this time? It's not just on security. I That's a that, one of but, the topics. Right. You said continue continuing the conversation, and as I understood it, I wasn't on the trip. But sure. as I understood, the conversation was largely about the security. That's ideas. right. That's right. Uh, I'd have to check if General Allen right. where what where he is in the world at this. Okay. And then the time. last thing is just uh, you're saying now that um, Livni and Arakat did meet here. They did, which I said on Monday too, you but did. I can give okay. you a little more I wasn't here on Monday, detail. So. No, 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 sure. that's okay. Um, uh, they met, uh, so the secretary met one on one uh, with Justice Minister Livney. He then met one on one with Dr. Erikat. They uh, then moved into a trilateral meeting with the three of them. Uh, Ambassador Indick and Frank Lowenstein also participated in the trilateral meeting, uh, and the meeting lasted about three hours. And that was on Monday? Uh, that was on uh, Monday, yes, that's correct. And that, you're counting that as a direct <coughs> negotiation meeting between the mm -hmm. two sides. So was that the first time they'd met since the Palestinian team had resigned? No, it was not. They have been meeting since then. Okay, and do you know when the next plans are for our direct meeting? I don't have any uh, details of that to announce for you. Uh, does it depend on whether the secretary's there? It does not. So it they does will, not. They have they... been meeting when he is not there. Mm -hmm. Any update on BSA negotiation, BSA signing of BSA? Do you have uh, a date for it? I don't have any update for you. Uh, any date today? for signing of BSA? I don't have a date for you. If I had a date for you, I would hopefully have announced that at the top of the briefing. There's one more on Pakistan's Prime Minister has proposed NSA level talks between India and EU Pakistan. How do you view this? Uh, uh, I would refer you to India and Pakistan. Of course, we support dialogue as a means for working through. Uh, differences, uh, and I, I would assume that is the case here as well, but I would point you to them for the purpose of their talks and whether they would support them. Catherine? Can I ask you about the Arctic? Um, sure. I think it was on Monday Canada submitted plans to the UN that would extend its um, sovereignty claims um, to include the North Pole, and I think it's 200 square kilometers past that as well. Um, do you have a reaction to that? And then on Tuesday, Putin um, made an announcement about moving military units in the Arctic. Do you have a reaction to that? And does the U.S. have plans to submit new plans to the U.N. that would include the North Pole? I am.
am weak on my Arctic guidance today, Catherine. <laughs> Come on. I should. It feels that the way north, outside. Yeah. No, the North Pole uh, is very important. Let and me... is Santa a U.S. citizen? <laughs> <laughs> Santa is a woman, just so you know. <laughs> and, she, and she is a citizen of the world. A citizen of the world. Santa will find you everywhere. That is what I always learned. Um, I would have to check on our specific reaction to the Canada announcement. I know that would be, of course, under the State Department purview. In terms of Russia moving military assets, I would point you to DOD on that. Uh, but I will circle up. Uh, with our Arctic team and see what we can offer to you. So the, has the U.S. already issued a visa to Santa? <laughs> to Santa. Santa does not need a visa. He has a visa waiver in the United States. Uh, so he can get to every house, uh, and I assume that's the case around the world as well. It just so we, up if he flies over China. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. The second one said that the Israeli defense minister and national security advisor were in Washington this week. That's right. Did he meet with them? Uh, I believe the meetings are happening later this week, and okay. certainly we'll have a readout of those. I, I think he has meetings at the White House as well as the State Department, and we'll provide a readout to all of you when they are happen. Are these talks about Iran only or about the security arrangements uh, for the israeli Palestine? They are focused on Iran. Uh, General Allen and his team are leading the efforts on the security arrangements. However, it's important to note that there are entities from virtually every relevant building working on that with his team, uh, but uh, but they are, the purposes are on Iran. But they will talk with the Israelis on these issues, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Jen, uh, uh, do you have any reaction on the Gulf states uh, statement after their summit in Kuwait? I would point you uh, to the Gulf states uh, on specifics on that uh, or, or DOD. They welcome the uh, agreement uh, that achieved between the P5 plus one and uh, Iran. Uh, I haven't read the full statement. I, uh, my understanding is most of it is military related, so that's why I pointed you to DOD. Yes, the president of the uh, Syrian coalition, Ahmed Al Jarba, at this summit yesterday, he mm -hmm. accused the Assad regime as uh, for arming the Al Qaeda and the extremists in Syria. Do you agree with uh, this accusation? Uh, I don't have anything for you on that. I haven't seen his comments. I'm happy to take a look at them and see if we have anything but more to add. Uh, your team uh, that fights the Al-Qaeda ideology put sure. videotapes, they're saying that the Al-Qaeda is fighting on the side of the regime. I mean, uh, We, have, you, you as you know, have been very concerned about extremists, including Al-Qaeda. I don't have anything more for you on it, though. Mm -hmm. Ukraine. Every year, this arm twisting by Russia on, with the gas taps goes on. Do you think this year it is uh, more than that in Ukraine? or? I, I will let you as a reporter do an analysis of that. Of course, there's a lot of focus on it, given yeah. Ukraine is making a choice about uh, the direction of their future. So that's why we're all talking about it. Philippines. Uh, Philippines? Philippines. Okay. The district uh, of the Secretary mm -hmm. Kelly. Uh, what going, you know, the United States uh, is going to discuss bilateral relationship uh, in terms of military cooperation or rearrangement of military balance in, the, in that region? Are we going to be talking yeah. about that? Yeah. Obviously, uh, Secretary Hagel would have uh, the lead on that. There are a range of issues uh, that will be discussed. We'll be doing a briefing in advance of the trip, so we'll get that around to all of you once we conclude that. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.